If you've ever wanted to sample the first two episodes of our special $15 Patreon tier level show, Invisible Choir Uncensored, absolutely free, now's your chance. We're running a special promotion now. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes, follow the directions, and the first two episodes are yours immediately at no cost. So click the link in the show notes and try the first two episodes of Invisible Choir Uncensored on us. Thanks for listening. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. What happens when the very people responsible for giving others second chances desperately needs one of their own? Are those cloaked in judicial robes more deserving than the rest of us? Or are we all capable of evil? This time on Invisible Choir. Yes, uh, my husband just beat me and threw me out of the car. He has my two daughters in the car. Uh, we have him all with us. He's in custody, no injuries um, that we can see. There's a gun on my bed, too. His vest is squirting up a lot. We need him to do the ambulance. I solemnly swear and affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of Ohio. Congratulations, Judge Mason. You are now official. Lance Timothy Mason was sworn in as a Cuyahoga County Court Common Pleas Judge in August of 2008. He was appointed by then-Ohio Governor Ted Strickland after a vacancy came available and was eventually elected to a full six-year term in 2010. It was the culmination of a series of prominent positions in public service. Judge Lance Mason, the Democrat, had previously been elected as an Ohio legislator, first as a state representative and then as a state senator, accumulating six years of service from 2002 to 2008. Mason was also an accomplished attorney, having previously served as an assistant prosecutor in Cuyahoga County. His colleagues described him as a pleasant, fair, and judicious man. He was just the type of community advocate with a steady hand and a calm presence that Cuyahoga residents needed. At just 40 years of age, he had already accumulated a lifetime of achievements in Ohio public service. He was finally settling into fatherhood with his then-wife Aisha and their two young daughters, till the early afternoon of Saturday, August 2, 2014, when he snapped. 12, 14 p.m., 46 seconds, August 2, 2014. All right, calm down so you can get some help, okay? Aisha Mason. 91, check your police emergency. Yes, uh, my husband just beat me and threw me out the car. He has my two daughters in the car. Where are you at? Van Aken Boulevard. Yeah. And like Avalon. He just threw me out the car. Orange Saturn View 2008. I'm afraid he's going to hurt my daughters. Is he with you now or did no, he drive off? He drove off. Which way on Van Aken? He went uh, going down towards the police station. He probably hit chagrin. 41 year old Aisha Mason, the wife of Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Judge Lance Mason phones 911 just after noon on Saturday to report her husband for domestic violence. While driving through the Shaker Heights neighborhood along the eastern rim of Cleveland, Aisha reported that she and her husband got into an argument that quickly escalated when he physically assaulted her before throwing her out of the vehicle and then driving off with her two children, both younger than eight years old. Okay, uh, yeah, somebody else called about that. Uh, where are you calling? What's your phone number? Where are you your calling? Uh, they're taking me to South Point now. Who's taking you to South Point? I, some nice people in the car stopped. I jumped in. You in the car now? In another person's car. Please find my kids. Are you injured? Yes. I need some air. Hello. Um, I is it like yeah? Because we're gonna. So do you want an officer to meet you up at uh, South Point then? Yes, but find my kids. Saturn View, 2008. Do you know the plate? Yeah. Do, uh, do you have the plate? Do you know the plate on it? It's. Uh, no, Y, it's no, Y, M, E, 479 or something like that. Y, M, E. A passing motorist who witnessed Aisha being thrown from the vehicle described seeing someone throwing punches inside of the swerving compact SUV and that whatever was going on inside caused the vehicle to swerve dramatically, narrowly avoiding several parked cars as it made its way through the neighborhood. Aisha Mason is out of breath and frantically begging police to find her vehicle and her children. Car 2214, 25, can just be a vibe. I'm speaking to uh, the victim, the, the wife, and uh, she got picked up by another vehicle. And uh, she's going to South Point. Where are you at right now? I'm heading up Van Aken. She uh, exited that uh, that orange vehicle, and she got picked up by a passerby. Okay. Hold on a second. 
Do you have another phone? Uh, okay. Sorry. Oh. Did you dial 921? Aisha's eventually picked up by a concerned motorist who sees her walking along Van Aken Boulevard, her face clearly swollen, bruised, and battered. She is growing increasingly frustrated that police aren't answering whether or not they found her children, and instead are insisting they send an officer to meet her there on the street where she was forced out of the vehicle by her husband. That's right. Yeah, ma'am, what's your first name? Aisha. Aisha. Okay, yeah. can you tell the driver just to stop where you're at? We're going to have the squad meet you. Oh, okay. An officer, okay? So where are you going to be pulling over at? Uh, we're at this church. St. Peter's Lutheran Church. No, no. St. Peter's Lutheran Church. They want you to pull over and park. So where are you at exactly? St. Peter's Lutheran Church at Van Aken and Ingleside. Did you find the car? 5252, uh, the vehicle stopped at Van Aken and Ingleside. I'm going to have the, the squad respond there. Did you find the what, what, kind of, what kind of car are you in? It's a black. What is this? They have the flashes on. It's a black. What kind of car is this? Mercedes. A black Mercedes. Yes. Did you find the Saturn she View? She could be in a black Mercedes with her flashes on. Van Aken, Ingleside. I'm calling the squad now. They're here. Did you find the Saturn View? Are you with an officer, ma'am? Yeah, they just pulled up. Did okay. you find the Saturn View? Did you find my kids? The call is abruptly terminated after Aisha Mason confirms that she has made initial contact with police. The dispatcher, never once acknowledging or answering her frantic question as to whether or not her children had been located. Police first on scene to question her after the altercation noted that her face was growing more swollen by the minute and that she had suffered several small lacerations and what appeared to be a large bite mark on her face. She was immediately taken to a nearby hospital for treatment while police continued looking for Mason and the two children in the 2008 Saturn View. Soon they would locate him after his own sister reportedly phoned police alerting them that he had returned to his home in Cleveland after the attack and that he was now threatening to kill himself. Though Lance and Aisha were still legally married at the time, they had actually separated some five months before in March and were only riding together on their way to a family funeral. After getting the tip from his sister, police rushed to Mason's Cleveland home and after encountering him standing outside in the street in the pouring rain, they immediately placed him under arrest. They weren't taking any chances after it was reported that he owned multiple firearms and that he was carefully loading one inside the house that he had planned to use to take his own life. Sam 13, Sam 14. I was going to kill myself, but no, Sam 14, go. Brian, uh, you're going to be tied up there. No, I can I handle the, uh, I have guns, uh, both sectors. Where's the weapons in this? I have a safe that I opened up so you can get to it. That copy, thanks. Guns uh, we have him with us. He's in custody, no injuries and, um, that we can see. There's a gun on my bed, too. The officers are gentle and friendly with Mason throughout his arrest as he calmly explains that he was going to kill himself. He alerts responding officers that he has already opened his gun safe inside the home and that there is another firearm laying on his bed. Body camera footage from the arrest shows Lance Mason standing on the sidewalk out front of his home in handcuffs with an officer holding him on either side. He is wearing a faded orange Nike Air t-shirt that is soaked around the neck and chest area in dark red blood. Apparently, it was all from his estranged wife, Aisha, from when he bit her in the face. How is she? Where is she? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, my, that's my sister. Okay. How's my wife? What do you mean, how's your wife? Where would your wife be? She was on. She jumped out the car. She's okay. She's okay. 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 I, I know nothing about that. Right. Let's go by over here. You know what? We'll put him in. A, this is Cleveland, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put him in my car. That way, oh, if you guys gotta break off, you'll be okay. Okay, Mr. Mason, go second car, okay? I'm glad, no, I'm glad. Go ahead. You're waiting for the guy to talk. For a lot of reasons. He's back in X-ray. Uh, we're in the room. Uh, we're just talking to the security. Put my glasses on my nose. Sure. Thank you. Okay, hold on, hold on, Mr. Mason. I want you. The black is pretty big fella now. They're gonna, they're gonna like grind your wrist down. It's too hard. Security sounds like he's had a couple different stories already. Are you happy? I'm sorry, you know what? Uh, you you watch this now. Is that better? Yeah, I'm on it. I'll let you know if I. Well, I'm, we didn't think you would have a seat. Yeah, 14, believe it. The house is clear. But we did find the assault rifle and a bandolier. Which one? Ammo and attic. You know what? Do this. Turn around and sit down. And now slide back. It's, you know, I don't know who in the world ordered these police cars. But I don't know. But I'm pretty sure it wasn't a police officer. Okay. Watch out, Mr. Mason. As the arresting officer loads Lance Mason in the back of his patrol car, he and another responding officer from another department discuss who will take him into custody. And if you listen carefully, you can hear officers discussing via radio in the background the large stash of weapons Mason had stockpiled inside of his home. All told, police confiscated two shotguns, 500 shotgun slugs, a 50-shell shotgun belt, an FNHP-90 semi-automatic rifle, a JLD Enterprises PTR-91 semi-automatic rifle, two handguns, a sword, four smoke grenade canisters, a bulletproof vest, a Jaguar knife, and approximately 2,300 live rounds of ammunition. It isn't the type of collection one would ordinarily assume belongs to a well-respected county common pleas judge, but his vast weapons collection was only one of the dark secrets Lance Mason was hiding in plain sight. The extent of Aisha Mason's injuries from the attack weren't reflective of a man who simply snapped in the moment of a heated argument, but of someone with a deeply violent spirit. In a matter of seconds, Aisha Mason suffered serious enough facial trauma, including a broken orbital bone in her eye socket, that she required facial reconstructive surgery. 
Lance Mason had purportedly punched his wife in the face with a closed fist some 20 times while the car was still moving, before choking her, biting her in the face, and then slamming her head into the dash and side window five times, all while their two small children sat watching in the back seat. Aisha Mason filed for divorce from her husband just two days after the attack and reverted back to her maiden name, Aisha Fraser. Lance Mason was initially indicted and charged with felonious assault, kidnapping, domestic violence, and endangering children, and was held without bond until he completed a mandatory psychiatric evaluation due to the suicide threats he made shortly after the attack. He was eventually released after posting a $65,000 bond and pleading not guilty, but not before a judge issued a protective order, barring him from having any contact with his wife or their two children, though he was eventually granted supervised visits with both girls. Lance Mason was also temporarily suspended from his judgeship with pay and was allowed to continue collecting his $121,000 annual salary while awaiting his pending trial. And then, nothing. For nearly one full year, Lance Mason's defense attorneys attempted to facilitate a plea agreement with the Cuyahoga County prosecutor that would spare their client of any prison time. But the prosecution wasn't budging. Then, on August 13, 2015, they had finally reached a deal. Lance Mason pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of attempted felonious assault and domestic violence, with an agreed-upon prison sentence ranging anywhere from 9 to 36 months for the brutal attack. As a newly convicted felon, Lance Mason was prohibited from serving as a judge in the state of Ohio, and the Ohio Supreme Court issued an indefinite felony suspension on his license to practice law. The once-revered judge, who had honorably served a career in public office, finally sat in a courtroom for sentencing on September 16, 2015. He was surrounded, not by those condoning his lengthy imprisonment, but by various supporters from throughout his life, some of whom spoke regarding his character, his intense remorse, and his emotional journey over the past year towards spiritual rehabilitation. One of his defense attorneys shared a letter he wrote in confidence to friend and fellow attorney Fernando Mack, who initially represented him pro bono shortly after his arrest. Upon his, upon his arrest, he asked how his wife and children were. Upon an attempt to interview him, he again asked about his wife and his girls. When he sat in jail, the, he wrote the following in confidence to his lawyer and friend, Mr. Mack. Lance wrote, I cannot begin to find the words to fully express how heartbroken, devastated, and hurt I am for the pain I caused my wife and girls. I am solely responsible. I am horrified, shocked, and confused by my actions. Nothing justifies the harm I've done to my wife and family. He went on to say, it was me. He wrote, I often heard defendants say it wasn't me, to express that their actions were out of character. I've had a life, he wrote, that I have prosecuted, legislated, and punished people for violence against women despite this commitment. I am haunted and don't fully understand why I hurt my wife and children. This was not my intention. Although I would like to deny it, I must admit that this somehow is not part of me. It was me, he wrote. I sincerely regret it. He went on to say, Judge, that I deeply hurt, I'm deeply hurt and ashamed by my conduct and pain I have caused my wife and children. I am determined, however, to undergo counseling with providers and my pastor and with enormous support from friends and family to eliminate whatever grief, fear, pain, anger, or whatever else led to my violence against my wife and children. Those words, Your Honor, are words from someone who the day after, or shortly thereafter, is contrite, sorry, and understanding of his actions. Your Honor, I would simply say to you, as you can see from this courtroom, Lance has incredible support from many diverse areas of his life. He has the support of lawyers and judges and all others who believe in him. Today, Your Honor, I simply ask you to balance the need for punishment, temper it with the understanding that steps Lance has already taken, consider the adoration of the event, and can it consider the faith that so many have him when you pass judgment on him today. Thank you. And then, Lance Mason's former college roommate, the addressee of the letter read aloud in court, defense attorney Fernando Mack, shared his thoughts on former Judge Lance Mason's likelihood of reoffending in such a violent and horrific way by sharing with the judge how the man who snapped that day wasn't the man he grew to know over 30 long years. Judge, what happened that day was wrong and inexcusable, and he's going to tell you that. I've known him for almost 30 years. I've never witnessed him in a fight. We were in college together. I never saw him in a fight. I've never seen him encourage violence. We've had conversations about violence. He's against domestic violence. And here we are. But you see, the guy that appeared on August 2nd of 2014, I didn't see him that day. And I've never met that guy. That guy who snapped that day, that was a two-minute creation. He was born that day. And he died that day, but we understand that the damage was done. While Fernando reflected on his close friend's transgressions that prior August, Lance Mason sat at the defense table and quietly wiped away his tears. You see, the day after the incident, I went to the jail to visit him. And while in jail, he was crying. And he asked, how could this have happened? Why did this happen? He said, I hurt my family. And I said to him, we need to get you out of here in a more stable and positive environment. 
He said, no, go check on my wife and my kids and make sure that they're okay. That guy who snapped was gone as quickly as he appeared. A guy that I still have yet to meet, but I acknowledge that he existed on August 2nd, 2014. The perfect storm of stressors and his bad decision making created an incident unlikely to reoccur. Lance Mason's sentencing hearing fast turned into a series of sob stories about the judge who failed to appropriately process the sudden death of his mother and father. The same man who quietly struggled with the fact that one of their daughters suffered from a serious medical condition that brought a tremendous amount of stress into their lives as parents. Lynn Mason, Lance's sister, the one who called 911 to alert police that he was planning to commit suicide after attacking Aisha, also spoke on his behalf. I had just arrived home and I received a phone call from him and I heard the desperate voice saying, Lynn, I hurt my wife and please come to the house and take care of my girls. When I got to the house, I had never seen him so distraught in my life. He literally was wailing and pleading to God for forgiveness. He said repeatedly, Lynn, please make sure you tell Aisha I am sorry and I love her. Then he would go into the room with his children and he would tell them how sad he was that they heard that he hurt their mother and to know that he is, they are daddy's precious babies and to always remember that he loved them. From that moment on, he has been remorseful. His first contact with Aisha after this incident was at the hearing for their divorce. And he sat the entire time silently weeping, his head bowed down because he was ashamed about what he, his actions were that day. And the restraining order prevented him from communicating his regret and remorse to her. Not only was he apologetic for his actions for, against her, but he was also desperately uh, offended and hurt that he hurt her parents and his children. And as um, Fernando was saying, that he has a very stoic demeanor, but people don't know what his private, quiet moments of introspection have been. Every day he tells me how sorry he is for what he did to Aisha and how that affects her, her parents, and the girls, and how he wished it never had happened. Every day he expresses that he wishes he could tell them he is sorry for what he did and take full ownership for his actions that day. He cries and openly admits to me how broken he was emotionally and spiritually to ever have harmed anyone, but especially his wife and in front of his children. He always says they did not deserve that. Two pastors, a close family friend, and a fellow politician also spoke on Lance's behalf, all sharing similar sentiments of a broken man who held everything in over the course of his entire life, instead choosing to give all he had to others until the stress caused him to one day snap. It was a proverbial who's who of Cleveland legal, spiritual, and Mason family connections. Before the judge would render her ruling, Lance Mason himself took to the podium to address the court for his actions that previous August. And I am solely responsible. And nothing justifies the harm I've done to my wife and my family. There hasn't been a, a day that I have uh, not regretted my actions. I was raised to be stoic, especially by my mom and the actions of my dad during challenging circumstances. But in private, there have been many nights on my knees and I've mourned the harm I've done to my family. I mean, I'm heartbroken and devastated for the pain I caused my wife and the girls, but it doesn't compare to the pain and devastation that I've done to them. And I can't undo that harm or undo what my girls witnessed, and it tears me apart. I struggle to understand my actions. I didn't know I was capable of doing this. I mean, I even bit my wife. I mean, that morning I prayed for my wife and children. I wasn't even gonna pick them up for the funeral. And I just went and picked them up because we were sharing a car. Um, but all of my life I fought against this type of brutality that I did to Aisha. When I became a judge, um, I mean, I, I wanted to be a judge at some point in my life, but I thought it would be 20 years later because I thought I was too young and didn't have enough experience. But there was a crisis in my home. And so I sought to come home to, uh, to continue to serve the public, but to, to take care of my parents, my father who had dementia, my mom who had a near fatal heart attack. Um, um, and also suffered dementia, dementia and I came home to help my wife because our daughter had just been born with uh, special needs and I didn't realize that I was this broken I mean I had no idea um, I probably I mean I blame my wife but I was I, I, I mean I was broken I've, un I've done everything I know to do to understand why I hurt my wife and children and jeopardize the lives of what I value most I will continue to do whatever is needed to ensure nothing like this happens again as people know that I've sought as much treatment as everything I knew to do. I've longed to apologize to my wife and her family, 
prior to the plea offer. I told my baby that I, I repeated, I told her that I was wrong for hitting her mom and that I was sorry. I failed the public. I failed my wife and my family. I failed my girls who I've tried to be a good example to and to protect every way I could. I'm probably overprotective. And because of my action, I realized that I've left my wife to raise our daughters alone, to provide for them alone. And it's against everything I've learned and everything I know and I sincerely regret it. My prayer is that in the future I live a life that will make it possible for Aisha and all that I've heard to forgive me. And I'm ready to be punished. In a bizarre display of support and mass showing of affection for the abuser, there was one critical voice missing in the courtroom that day at the hearing, Aisha Frazier's. She had written a letter to the judge that it was never read aloud at the hearing, so Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Judge Patricia Cosgrove spoke on Aisha's behalf, reminding everyone in attendance who was rallying their support behind Lance Mason of his explosively brutal actions that day. Before administering her sentence, Judge Cosgrove reminded Lance Mason, still standing before her, wiping his teary eyes dry, that the only thing Aisha said in the car to him that day before he brutalized her was that she wanted him to get help before she would consider getting back together with him. That simple request was all it took to trigger the former judge into brutally attacking his estranged wife in front of their children. Judge Cosgrove then finally brought the full brutality of the attack to light, sharing the details of the traumatic incident from Aisha's perspective. The victim stated they were driving back from a funeral and the defendant began to argue about their marriage. Their two daughters were in the back seat of the vehicle. The defendant was driving and he was in the front and she was in the front passenger seat. The defendant began punching her with his right fist in the head while driving. She stated it was a closed fist and he punched her approximately 20 times. After punching her, the defendant grabbed her hair on the back of her head, smashed it against the center console approximately five times. The victim stated as he was beating her, she continuously pressed on the vehicle's horn, hoping to get somebody's attention to help her. The victim then stated that the defendant began to choke her, but was unable to do so. Uh, he used his arm to pin her head and neck against the passenger door window. The two children were in the back seat of the vehicle screaming and crying. That's probably, in addition to the terrible, savage beating that you gave your wife, the fact that your children are in the back witnessing this, screaming and crying, uh, exposing your children to this kind of violence is, um, is really unbelievable. The vehicle came to a stop at the red light and the victim attempted to get out. The defendant grabbed her by her hair and would not let go. The victim was able to escape his grasp and exited the vehicle and onto the street. The defendant then crawled over the center console and the passenger seat, exiting the vehicle on the street and got on top of the victim. The defendant continued to punch the victim in the face three or four more times, bit her on her right ear, saying, your life is over now. The defendant then got back into the vehicle and drove away. The victim then got up, ran down the street, and she came across some Samaritans who, who helped her. Uh, and again, you know, all these people in the back of the courtroom, if you had reached out to them, there was a period of time, obviously, you separated in March of 04, before this incident in August of uh, 2014, excuse me, and one of them would have helped you. Or if you'd gone to this counselor, or if you'd gone to this social worker, or if you'd gone to this pastor before this happened and reached out, they would have helped you. Judge Cosgrove then took out several large color photographs of Aisha's face, taken immediately following the vicious attack, and forced Lance Mason to confront the results of his actions head on. There's not one person in this courtroom who doesn't carry a burden with him. Either a sick child, or you lose your husband, or you lose your wife, or you lose a child, or your financial problems. But you don't take it on another human beings. I'm looking at these pictures here of Aisha. They're horrible. This one here shows uh, not only her eyes are swollen shut, uh, she's got a bite mark on her cheek. Right there. You weren't satisfied to beat her, you be better. Uh, her eyes are swollen shut to the point, her orbital bone. And I'm not going to go through the multiple bruises on here. And in fashioning a sentence, the court also has to consider not only the, the physic, physical harm that you caused her, but also the psychological harm as well. Judge Cosgrove then read aloud a portion of Aisha Mason's victim impact statement from a previous pre-sentencing hearing. In it, Aisha described how the attack left her with severe nerve damage on the left side of her face, an area she still had no feeling in one year after the attack. She also described suffering from severe post-traumatic stress disorder and shared how Lance Mason had caused her years of extreme emotional distress earlier on in their marriage. After considering the violent nature and brutality of the offense, Judge Cosgrove sentenced Lance Mason to 24 months for the attempted felonious assault conviction and six additional months for domestic violence and ordered both be served concurrently for a total period of two years in prison. Judge Cosgrove then encouraged Lance Mason to try to turn a negative into a positive and to avail himself to whatever programming, counseling, or spiritual guidance he could while in prison. She also ordered him to attend a series of anger management courses while incarcerated to help him gain control of his rage. 
Then, before he was led away to begin serving his 24-month sentence, one of Mason's attorneys requested the judge waive any court costs or fees associated with the sentencing, reminding the court that Lance Mason's entire legal team was defending him pro bono, free of charge, and that they didn't want to impose any additional financial hardship on Lance Mason or his family. She granted the request, and Mason was led away in handcuffs to the supportive cheers of the many who gathered to support him. It wasn't a typical perp walk out of the courtroom, as friends, family, and colleagues yelled out to the disgraced former judge that they loved him, while he acknowledged, quote, I'm good, I'm strong. While housed in protective custody at the Lorraine Correctional Institute in Grafton, Ohio, Lance Mason was unable to participate in extensive rehabilitative programming due to his high-profile status, though he did enroll in the mandatory thinking skills class and victims' awareness courses made available by the facility's mental health department. He was also a participant in the Thinking for a Change and Cage Your Rage programs, which are aimed at assisting offenders in redirecting their violent thoughts and gaining control of their aggression and rage. Lance Mason was also active in the prison church and Bible study programs, and he regularly attended Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, quote, for the sole purpose of supporting the other inmates. After serving only nine of his 24-month sentence, attorneys filed a judicial appeal for Mason's early release in the spring of 2016, citing his extensive commitment to his own rehabilitation. His appeal was granted, and Lance Mason, the disgraced former judge and public servant, was once again a free man. Upon his release on June 27, 2016, Lance Mason began his three years of mandatory post-release supervision, checking in with his assigned probation agent once a month. He never missed a single meeting, and his drug screens always came back negative. It seemed that his fall from grace had humbled the former judge. A protective order still prevented him from contacting his now ex-wife Aisha Frazier, though he was eventually granted supervised visits with both of his daughters. Now raising the girls on her own, Aisha Fraser filed a civil suit against her former husband due to the extreme financial hardship the attack and his subsequent incarceration had caused her. She was eventually awarded $150,000 in damages. As the former judge settled into his new routine, he faced his next professional hurdle the following year in June of 2017 when the Board of Professional Conduct reviewed his license to practice law. As a convicted felon, Mason was no longer eligible to serve as a judge in the state of Ohio, but the board could move to reinstate his law license if they felt he had been sufficiently rehabilitated. In a showing of support rivaling that of his initial sentencing hearing in September of 2015, dozens of Lance Mason's friends, former colleagues, and public servants alike all sent letters of support on his behalf, recommending that he be considered for bar eligibility moving forward. Several prominent Cleveland attorneys, four sitting judges, and a United States Congresswoman all submitted letters of support and were willing to stake their names, and more importantly, their good reputations, on the belief that Lance Mason was incapable of recommitting such a violent offense. The court's administrative and presiding judge even wrote to the board himself, expressing, quote, what he did to his wife is both unfortunate and indefensible, but I hope the Board of Professional Conduct considers the entirety of Lance Mason's career and future potential in making their decision. He lost everything that day, but there is still time for the Lance Mason I once knew to put his skills to use in helping others. Regardless of the incredible outpouring of support, the Board eventually recommended that the Ohio Supreme Court permanently disbar Lance Mason. And later on in December of that year, they opted to suspend his license to practice law indefinitely. But the month before, in November, in a striking move of confidence and faith in Lance Mason's rehabilitation, he was granted a second chance at public service when Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson hired him on as Cleveland's Minority Business Development Director, a position at City Hall that paid $45,000 per year. Mayor Jackson had actively promoted the hiring of convicted felons previously, so bringing the former judge onto his team seemed a natural fit. Lance Mason continued leading a relatively uneventful life, attempting to rebuild everything that had been lost the instant he snapped, severely beating his wife while his two children looked on in horror. But on November 17, 2018, just the week before Thanksgiving, everyone who stood by and supported the former judge, from those who spoke at his domestic violence sentencing hearing to those who wrote glowing letters of support to the Board of Professional Conduct, were all proven wrong when he snapped again. Come here. Now, what's your emergency? I need the police immediately. My brother is attacking his ex-wife. Okay, what is the phone number? Or what is the address? 17611 Chagrin Boulevard. Okay, is this a house or we're an apartment? Need an, we're going to need an ambulance to I need police and ambulance. Okay, is this a house or an apartment? It's a house. And are they both still there? They're outside. I I, I don't know. I just heard screaming. Okay, are there any guns or knives involved? Any I don't know. I think of? there might be. I think there might be. Lynn Mason, the same sister who phoned 911 on her brother over four years before, after he had brutally attacked his then-estranged wife, Aisha, and then threatened suicide, was calling for urgent police and medical support. The couple had an arrangement where they agreed to exchange custody of their daughters at Lynn's home on the 17,000 block of Chagrin Boulevard in Shaker Heights. Aisha actually owned the property and Lynn was renting it while Lance was living there with her as well, so it seemed the perfect neutral grounds to safely transition visitation between their children. Aisha had just pulled into the driveway after 9 a.m. She was dropping off one of their daughters to visit with Lance when he ambushed her there in the driveway the moment she stepped out of her vehicle. Please hurry. 
Okay, could you just stay on the phone with me and let me know what's going on? Okay, I have the daughter. I'm in fight with the daughter, so I don't want her to see anything. Okay, yeah, keep her in there and try to stay calm so she doesn't get upset. I'm going to get okay. my guys started out that way, okay? So okay. just stay on the phone with me. Okay. Let me see what's going on. You stay here. I'm just going to check outside. Radio 50 and 31. Also 78, respond to 17611. I don't know. Sugar and caller's advising that her brother is attacking his ex-wife. They are currently outside. She is in the house with a, their daughter. She's trying to keep me updated on what's going on. Could you see them or hear them now? She does not know if there's any weapons involved. Okay, go with the address. Ma'am. One seven six one 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 seven six one one. Yes, ma'am. He stabbed her and he said she's dead. Oh my gosh. Shaker units. They're by. She's advising that her brother said he stabbed his ex-wife and she's dead. Hey, Katie, that's a possible stabbing the DLA. Okay, is he? Is he still there? In the driveway. Okay, what is he doing now? Lance Mason stood outside in the driveway, patiently waiting for his ex-wife to arrive. When she finally did, he took two kitchen knives from inside of the home and began stabbing her in front of their daughter in the driveway. In the completely unprovoked sneak attack, he stabbed her an astounding 59 times until she died there in a pool of her own blood. Okay, is that him coming back in the house? He's inside the house. Okay, could you tell me what he's wearing? A uh, black coat. Okay. And jeans. Does he still have the knife? Did he leave it outside? I don't know. He walked in and there's blood everywhere. Could you see where your brother went? He would, I didn't see. I'm with the girls. Okay. Bravo 1 to 33. We're going to need you up here. Could you also start a squad? The squad is en route. Also, she does not know where her brother went. He did go back outside. I don't know what direction he went. Stay away from him. Adam, I need you to get a go team ready. I need three eyes on you right now. Okay, is he back in the house? He's back in the house. Caller's advising he's back in the house. Okay, are my officers there? one radio, we have one female down. She does look like she's been stabbed. After initially coming back inside the home, covered in his ex-wife's blood, Lance Mason sees police already arriving on scene, staging outside. So he fled back out to the driveway and got into Aisha Frazier's black Audi SUV. And in a wild last-ditch effort to escape, rammed a Shaker Heights patrol unit. Officer Adam Flint had just stepped out of the patrol vehicle and was violently struck in the legs and ribs. Lance Mason then took one of the kitchen knives he still had on his person and attempted to slit his wrist. And then, in a last-ditch effort to escape the growing cadre of officers now staging in the street, he stumbled out of the SUV, and when one of the officers turned his canine unit loose, he ran back inside the home to where his sister and children were now cowering in fear. The entire confusing interaction outside was caught on police body cam. Hey! Is it, is it that house? It's one one. It's on this side of the street. It's it's it's, it's him. He came out of the house. It's him. What's up? Put your hands up. Put your hands up now. Put your hands up. Put it up. Put it up. You're gonna get shot. Put your hands up. Lynn Mason remained on the line with 911 during her brother's frightening retreat back into the house. Police immediately pursued him inside once they confirmed his whereabouts. Wait, you're the squad to my location. The guy ran me from behind. <laughs> There's an upstairs and downstairs. Where the downstairs? There's an upstairs number for this address, please. I'm trying to call somebody. Okay, where did your brother go? Do you know? He's, he's walking around. Just walking around. They're more with us right now. I, I see he wants to die, too, so... Okay, my officers are going to be making entry. Where are you at in the house? Um, I'm in the, I'm facing the street and we're living with the girls. Okay, what part of the house are you in? It's facing the street and we're in the living room. I've got a three-man team going in, 520. I've got 25, 31, 78, and Detective Selby. Entering now. I know you're not. Go on, I'm at the back of the house. Okay, where's the brother at now? In the kitchen. He's walking through. I mean, he's just... Walking around. Where's the kitchen at? The front or the back of the house? I'm peeking through the, the blind. It's a bleak thing. 10-4. She is down. She is not breathing. 10-4. I see one officer with a gun point. Now at Chagrin and 
Normandy. That's where we are. I need a rescue. Okay, where's your brother at now in the house? He's with me. Okay, and you guys are in the living room? Are you in the rescue team? Cross the Down here now. Normandy is the Okay. They are in route. They're coming now. Okay, what part of the house has a living room in, ma'am? I'm, I'm telling you, it's facing the street. Okay. I'm, I'm, like, I see one off. 71 is on the back side. He's at the one. Okay. Two-four made entry into the house with the team. Okay, are the police in there now, ma'am? Yes, yes. Okay. The one they made contact with. I know you don't, baby. Okay, they're with the brother now? I know, baby. I know, I know. I'm so sorry. Okay, ma'am, am I able to get your name? Yeah, my name? Yes. Lynn. Lynn. Lynn Mason. Lynn. L-Y-N-N. Mason? Yes. What is your brother's name? Lance. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get off the phone with you, okay? So you can take okay. care of your girls. All right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Lynn Mason, now stuttering in shock, attempts to comfort Aisha and Lance's daughters, who are completely distraught at the horrific scene that has just unfolded in front of them. Police body cams capture Lance Mason's final moments inside the home, where police eventually detain him. He is quickly losing blood and running out of time. Where is it? Are they hurt? They're in this bedroom. Are they hurt? No, not in any way. Okay, where's the weapon? Uh, they're outside. I used the armor. Any possibility of Pepsi, C, anything like that, blood-related passages? No. Okay. Is anyone else injured in this house? No. All right, roll to your side. Let's get you on your feet. Stand on feet? Yep. Who's upstairs? Oh, Wait, hang on, hang on. Neighbor. I have no weapons. <laughs> All right, on your feet. Here, just on your butt. All right, let's get on your knees. On your knees. Hold on this. I need to put my belt All the way up. Oh, you got someone with you? Okay, hang on. Let's get him out. You got him? You got him? I got a, I got a hey, he's, 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 his wrist is squirting out blood. We need him to lay him okay. down. Let's squirting go. out blood. Squirting out blood. Go. Okay. Come on. Watch, 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 watch. Where's the ambulance at? Hold him up with the the back with your hands. So we're staying with him. I am. Got him. Stay with him. All right. All right. We need another squad. We need another squad out here. Sit him down. Stop. He's bleeding out. Let's go. No, he's not bleeding out. You need to be operational. Okay. Have a seat right here. Were you hit anywhere? Were you stabbed at all? That's only if I hurt myself. Hold him up. He's just a hindrance. Two people uninjured in there. Here. Three people. Three people uninjured. Yeah, my two daughters and. I cannot believe I did this. Okay, come on this way. He is bleeding from his hands. So we'll need him in this ambulance. Right this way. He told me he has nothing to say after I Mirandized him. Okay. See the smaller one right here? Yeah. Is that one spurting off? That one's not spurting. That's okay. just using. Okay. Bring the string. There you go. Lance Mason was taken to a nearby hospital for treatment of his self-inflicted injuries, while his ex-wife Aisha Fraser's body was taken to the morgue. Their daughters, aged 8 and 11 at the time they bore witness to their mother's murder, were placed into the care of their godmother, Aisha's best friend. Lance Mason was eventually arrested and charged with aggravated murder, murder, felonious assault on Aisha Fraser, violation of her protection order, grand theft auto, and felonious assault of an officer. Shockingly, he initially pleaded not guilty to all charges, perhaps believing he could somehow weasel one last grand gesture of empathy from the small army of supporters he had enlisted during his first domestic violence conviction from four years before. But he eventually had a change of heart and pleaded guilty to all charges, claiming that he did so to spare his daughters the trauma of having to sit through a trial. Former Judge Lance Mason finally sat for sentencing on September 12, 2019, in the very same Cuyahoga County Common Pleas courtroom over which he once presided. It was packed with loved ones, family members, and supporters this time for Aisha Fraser. Fellow teachers from the Woodbury Upper Elementary School, where she faithfully taught sixth grade for nearly 16 years, packed the courtroom. And her best friend, the children's godmother, spoke passionately against Lance Mason, ever seeing the light of day again outside of a prison cell. And then, Aisha's elderly mother, Millicent Fraser, gave her victim impact statement, repeatedly turning to address the man who for so long emotionally and physically abused her daughter, receiving one second chance after another from the very court system in which he worked, until he one day carried out her premeditated murder. 
Millicent Fraser didn't mince her words while addressing her former son-in-law one last time. And our message to you, Lance, is one does not have the right to control a person. Everyone deserves their space and quiet moments of peace. Lance, you never provided that for our daughter. Today, I confront you on behalf of my husband and myself for the aggression that you had rendered to my daughter and our family, causing her to live in fear and ultimately resulting in Aisha's murder at your hands. Lance Mason, Aisha was our only child, and because of your aggression, uncooperative, nonconformist attitudes and outcomes, as well as your inability to take responsibility for your actions, our daughter is dead by your hands. You have never conformed to psychiatric treatment or evaluation. Your behavior has included mental outrage and aggressiveness, most probably beginning at a very early age. Your ideas about life with your mate was to control and dictate. If Aisha conformed to you, everything was fine. If she did not, you would go crazy, yelling and screaming and calling her names. You have gotten away with this behavior all of your life. Your parents and relatives all looked in the other direction because you could do no wrong. You were never fit to be anyone's husband because you had so many insecurities. You went to pre-marriage counseling sessions and you ignored their advice. A loving relationship should, be monitored, should not be monitored or controlled. When Aisha had enough of your verbal abuse, love of guns and violent behavior, she was determined it was time for her and the children to leave. The idea that you brought weapons and hand grenades into the home to assure control of your wife, along with your two precious daughters, became unfathomable for them, but not you. You claimed that you wanted to be the protector for your children. Instead, you put fear in their hearts and souls with your behavior. You wanted to smother them with your insane ideas of what a father should be. You continued to persecute our daughter during your separation and even after your divorce by demanding that your children be transported to Baskin and Robbins every evening so that you could kiss them goodnight. If you truly love your children, you would have never have subjected them to the mental abuse you thrust upon my late daughter and their mother. You're a monster and you believe that your children, your behavior was accepted and allowed. In 2014, if you really love your children, how could you repeatedly violate their trust in you by brutally beating their mother the very first time in their presence and treating it like it was nothing, saying that your mother, their mother drove you to it. The second time you premeditated her murder and you planned it as soon as she dropped off the children so that they became witnesses to your horror in 2018. You are a vicious liar with no remorse other than the fact that you ruined your own career. What a monster you are. We ask that the courts render a sentence of life in prison to you without the possibility of parole. I personally have nothing more to share because nothing will ever bring back our daughter. This is our life sentence and nothing can ever change that outcome. Every single person who spoke at Lance Mason's sentencing hearing that day requested that retired Stark County Common Pleas Court Judge John G. Haas give him the maximum allowable sentence, life in prison without the possibility of parole. But in another stunning turn of events, former Judge Lance Mason was offered one last shimmer of hope, one last possible second chance by a judge who sat in the same chair and shared the same sacred oath and robe as he once did. Dealing with the last count first, Officer Flint, felonious assault, a felony of the first degree because he is a police officer. This highlights the danger the police face every day for just doing his job, serving the public. The sentence the court finds is five years consecutive to all other time imposed. Count four, Violating a protection order, court imposes a sentence of 24 months, which will be served concurrent to all other time imposed. Count five, grand theft, the court imposes a sentence of 12 months, which will be served concurrent to all other time imposed. That brings me to the aggravated murder of Aisha Frazier. I cannot add to the words you have already heard and have no doubt internalized over your period of incarceration. The children, while I respect your decision to spare them the trauma of a trial, it was too little and way too late. Where was that consideration when you subjected them to the vicious attack on their mother? We can only pray for them to have the strength to cope with and to overcome the trauma of that day. For Aisha, the loss of life, the loss of opportunity to nurture her children, and so many other people in her life and the children she was teaching through her profession. You deserve the maximum sentence of state request. However, 
If there is something, anything positive to transpire out of this in the future, is for you to make a difference while you are in prison, to help others with your background, to demonstrate a servant attitude. It is for that reason only that after you serve the five years for Officer Flint and 30 years for the aggravated murder as part of a life sentence, you will then be eligible to appear before a parole board. It seemed that nearly everyone involved in this case, from the attorneys who represented Lance Mason free of charge, to his friends in high places, nearly every one of whom placed their own reputations at risk by extending him their unconditional support, forgot one thing. Lance Mason violently attacked his wife. This story should never have been about him, but they created a whirlwind of support and momentum around a man who many claimed had exhibited violent homicidal tendencies early on. And instead of acknowledging the horrific warning signs, the brutal assault, or the emotional abuse, they never saw Aisha Fraser, the victim, who so desperately needed their support and their commitment to ensure that her husband would never harm her or their children again. Instead, they only saw Lance Mason, one of their own, a man of the bar, a career public servant who was at risk of losing it all. Instead of supporting Aisha Fraser while she was still alive, they empathized with him, his career, and his future. It is said that you know that you lived a good life when people never stop mentioning your name. Her name will be mentioned for very, 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 very many years. 